Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Jean-Paul Schmetz as the keynote speaker for today. And he's the chief scientist at Hubert Buddha Media. He's also the founder and CEO of uh, uh, 10 Better Pages. And uh, he's going to talk today about dealing with complexity. Thanks. I, I hope you... Wait until I've said something. <laughs> no, no, but as, so um, let me introduce you uh, a little bit who I work for so you get an idea why I feel that I can talk about complexity. Uh, I'll try to talk for maybe 40 minutes and then have uh, questions afterwards. Uh, so basically the group is called Hubert Buddha Media. It's owned by one guy, started 100 years ago, over 100 years ago, has only had four CEOs during that time. So that I think is, uh, is, is a good thing and also a sign that we don't like complexity. Uh, it started in printing with a magazine, International uh, and Digital. Um, you, you may know, if you, if you live in Germany, you may know some of these brands. Uh, Buddha Digital was founded in 93. Um, it participated actively in the development of the internet. Few people know that we actually tried to buy Netscape in 95. Um, we developed into a group of 40 companies and about two or three billion in revenue, depending on how you exactly count it. Uh, it's about 5,000 5, people with 30% growth year over year of about 1,500 engineers, so we are constantly hiring. Um, we cover pretty much all advertising models that you can find uh, on the internet, so uh, we have a lot of experience with also the big data issues that are faced with advertising. In fact, we are the largest owner of the seventh largest advertising network in the U.S., uh, called GLAM, and I think we number two or so, or three in Germany. Uh, matching recommendation systems, also big data problem. Review sites like Holiday Check, which are also interesting data problems. Uh, content, less relevant for data, e-commerce, search, very relevant for, for big data, social networks like Zing, and marketplaces. So why a chief scientist? Um, so that's my title. We, we, I'm not a CTO. Uh, we have many CTOs. Uh, we noticed that people tended to get stuck in the technology of their founding. So I have this little game that I can always tell when your company is founded by looking at your code. Uh, and it's very precise. It's like carbon dating. It's a very, very, very nice <laughs> little game. Um, we have similar problems solved at different places simultaneously, which we don't mind at all, but it's a bit stupid if no one knows that they're being solved simultaneously. Um, engineer gets stuck to their product until they have to leave, because uh, if you want to do green, uh, a greenfield approach of something, you often have to quit your job, which is not a good thing. Um, and certain hiring is easier at a central level. But the real reason is that there's way too much complexity, and that's the reason why you need someone like me. Um, I'm a hacker since the late 70s, I studied philosophy and econometrics because computer science was really not cool at the time I studied. It was uh, uh, not even possible sometimes to study computer science. Uh, I joined Boda in 94 on a machine learning hack. Uh, if you know Boda, we, uh, they, they, they had a, actually the name Boda comes from a magazine uh, which had sewing patterns, uh, which looked like very interesting and complicated. Uh, drawings, and I actually tried to use machine learning to learn how to build them. Um, learned a few lessons doing that. Uh, it was working technically, but no one liked it. Um, I've been the CTO and the CEO of Brother Digital, and then a technical board member, and I uh, actually went to Stanford to study real computer science, so I'm officially a big data guy from Stanford, so normally I should know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I'm a chief scientist and actively developing products and teams again uh, for Boda. So now to the problem. What's the problem? Uh, people get stuck. Uh, they get stuck before they get successful, so many startups simply never get uh, to the point where they're doing what they were planning to do. They get stuck as they get successful, they get stuck after they get successful, uh, and even when people don't get stuck themselves, someone else makes them stuck. Uh, and even if you're the greatest, sometimes some code from 1995 that you wrote uh, will get you stuck again. And, and mostly that's because of complexity. Uh, so what is complexity? I've come up with, uh, I think it's my definition, but you know, f feel free to use it, is complexity is whatever prevents you or someone else from doing the right thing now or in the future. Right? So it's not about 
necessarily numbers of lines of codes. It's not about uh, using assembly language versus Python. It's not about using stuff that appeared difficult to you because you just learned it last week. Uh, it's really about whether what you have done today um, is going to prevent you or someone else from doing the right thing in the future. Uh, and simplicity is the opposite. It's if you build something that allows people in the future or yourself in the future to do the right thing when you know what the right thing is, right? Because it's easy to do that when you know what the right thing will be. Uh, but if you don't know, it's a bit uh, difficult. So creating complexity is very easy. That's the problem. Uh, and making things simple is very, very difficult. Um, and ability to deal with change is a litmus test of your level of complexity. So if you, uh, as many of our companies, if you, it become obvious that you have to, uh, I'll give you an example from 2003 or 4, uh, we had the largest used bookstore in the world that we sold to Amazon and it became obvious that we needed to have uh, a very simple URL scheme for Google to be able to find books in us. So we had thousands of versions of Harry Potter, and we wanted to have a, a URL that would say abooks.com slash Harry Potter and have all the books there ranked by some kind of thing and have Google find it. Unfortunately, uh, in the early 2000s, people decided that Java was very cool and it would be even cooler to have a website with only one URL. Uh, right? And then everything would be a session. And the ability to adapt to the fact that Google uh, you know, understandably required a unique URL for a concept, uh, it took them two or three years to adopt. Right? So, so that's complexity, even though the code was not necessarily particularly complex, but the fact that you couldn't adopt uh, an obvious change was a sign that your uh, system was too complex. Uh, so simplicity in that definition is a prerequisite for agility, that's pretty obvious. Uh, it's also requisite for reliability. That's a well-known concept from um, uh, the 70s, I think, OR uh, and Dijkstra were the first ones to work out formally what the relationship between simplicity and reliability really is. It's a prerequisite for, oh, sorry, it's a prerequisite for scalability, and it's a prerequisite for pretty much everything, right? But it's not easy and convenient. Um, in, in fact. Uh, people often make this kind of connection. Sorry, just one. Uh, but basically, uh, simplicity is difficult and is related to understanding. Right? So it has nothing to do with, with easy. It's actually very difficult. Um, and the word complexity, or I guess you can, you, there's a word in English called complecting, which is to intertwine and to interweave uh, stuff. and. Uh, you know, you can import a hairball into your code very easily. Renaming it or adding in a direction uh, doesn't necessarily fix the problem. Right? Um, complexity arising, so in practice, this is a more practical thing. You have a small team, great ideas, good tools, and a lot of understanding because you're doing something you truly understand and you're implementing it, so there's no complexity at that level. But your code base grows, people issues, people base grows, understanding issue arise. You start to implement stand-ups and meetings and all again is well in La La Land. Uh, but there's a gorilla growing in the, in the room. New people come on board, but they can't figure out why you've done something before. You, they, they can't seem to figure out, you know, the learning curve is too steep. Everything gets really difficult. The founder take leave because they are burned out and yearn for simplicity and starting over again. A guru comes and advise, etc., etc., until Google uh, basically eats your lunch because they are big and simple. Um, so there, uh, there are some theoretical signs of complexity. This is more theory. Practice, I think, is what I just showed you. Uh, large number of components, large number of interconnections, they're well known. Many irregularities, so many exceptions. Uh, long descriptions, which is called Kolmogorov complexity. If, if the, the, the smallest description of, your, um, of what you are trying to do, uh, well, the longer the smallest description is, the more complex your thing is. Uh, and large numbers of designer, implementers, or maintainers are theoretical uh, signs. The theoretical um, consequences of 
um, of complexities are emergent properties. So in, in human terms, is uh, if you have one person taking a decision, it's usually very easy to understand why the decision was taken. You may not agree with it, but it's easy to figure out. If you have a large group of people, they tend to take decisions that no one would have taken by themselves, so it's become very difficult to understand. Uh, code can end up and systems can end up like this. Propagation of effects is clear. You change something on one side and something pop up on the other side. Uh, incommensurate scaling is a interesting phenomenon where I think the, one of the easiest examples to understand is that if you make a ship bigger, at one point the stopping distance will be larger than the viewing distance. So it will, you, you can never stop it in, in the sense that you cannot see that you need to stop and stop in the distance that you will cover in, in the stopping distance because one part of your system is growing at n square and the other one is growing at n or something like this. Uh, and then you have trade-off, meaning you cannot do this and that, you have to do this or that. Um, most people associate complexity with code, which is a very interesting phenomenon. So if... Um, if one of our bigger companies get in trouble, you can be assured that the first project that they will do is a modularization uh, projects. Um, but it very, very rarely comes from that. Uh, it's actually, um, it's really more about how you code intertwined with other things. Uh, and that is mostly people and data. Um, it's obviously better to not have code intertwined with too much other code, but that's really not that much of a problem. Um, and code is normally easily replaced and should be replaced easily. Most of the time people stick around with code for way too long. Um, or it should never be replaced in some cases. I don't feel like I need to replace the source code of LS in Unix. It seems to work fine uh, as is. So, but you have to make that difference. Uh, most of the time, uh, so here, I'll show you some code that is well-documented, well-modularized, and everything. And another piece of code, this is from a coding test that we give to people. So that, that was one candidate uh, attempt. Uh, well-documented, absolutely perfect, probably done in Java or something. Um, except it failed most of the tests. Uh, and the one that was undocumented, uh, undocumented actually got uh, zero or 200 uh, failures, actually. I should have written this correctly. So the small one was actually working. And you'll never have to change it again. So the, the theory is that if you modularize, if you create abstractions or implementation and interface, layering, like most computer systems, you have the file system and then you have another layer on top of it, hierarchy, you should be okay. And there's this legend that any problem in a computer system can be solved by adding a layer of indirection. In this particular case, basically what you do is you delay some decision and you uh, put a name on it, and then normally every, uh, it's a bit of a joke, right? It, it, I think they meant it seriously, but I think it's a joke. Uh, so that's what it is. If you don't know that, try that in your Python interpreter. It actually works. Um, so here, what do you have? You have an abstraction which reduces complexity and in a direction that makes it completely uh, increase in complexity, right? You, you will never, um, this is the, the only danger of code, right? You, you've done something that looks simple, but in fact you've made it virtually, I mean, it's only one line, but if you were to write your whole code based on that import, uh, you could fly around the world with it, apparently, because you imported intergravity, but you have no idea what's going on under your abstraction layer, and you've, uh, if you need to fly differently, essentially you've done nothing. So you have to be very careful when you take these decisions. Um, and obviously the problem is choosing the right, then use whatever word you want for, uh, for what creates simplicity. From a C of alternative, it's obviously where it breaks because you can't, you can't really do it. And in fact, simplicity is the only solution to complexity. There is no, um, there is no alternative, but that's obviously hard, as we said anyway. Uh, and a guy called Guy said once that a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that works. And the key word is evolved. Um, so in order to make a simple system or to avoid building complex system, which is often the, the, the thing you should do, is you have to design for iteration. Uh, and designing for iteration is the definition of simplicity because you allow 
people to do the right thing, or you allow yourself to do the right thing uh, in the future. Data. Data is usually the biggest source of complexity. I'm going to talk a little bit about a different type of data. I'll come to more machine learning trained data in a, in a minute. Uh, data is usually the biggest source of complexity because uh, people do not necessarily know data structure and do not really think enough about it. Uh, your code is usually useless without the data, uh, especially if you're building an e-commerce shop or something like this. Uh, I'm sure, the code is nice, but you have to write to a database, you have to read to a database, etc. Um, and usually because of stupidity tools and frameworks, data can never be tested, replayed, cloned, kept in sync, etc., etc. So, so typically, uh, as you know, code and data are really the same thing um, at a very low level, except that data is a problem. If you have a bug in your code, you can rerun your code after you fix the bug. If you have a bug in, or you introduce a bug in your data, most likely your whole data is corrupted. So imagine like you're running your code and every bug destroys your code completely. Uh, that's usually what happens, right? Um, and usually when I have to fix a, a crisis, it's usually because of the way code and data actually interacts. That's the key problem. That uh, Don't forget, I have to fix complexity problems so people are not able to change and do the right thing. And the reason why they're not able to do the right thing is because of the way code and data interact. Um, so OIR, it's the guy we invented, quick start, is simplicity of the unavoidable price we have to pay for reliability. But notice the title of the paper, Data Reliability, a very interesting concept. Uh, it's a bit antiquated, the paper, but basically talks about uh, exactly where complexity comes in the data and why it's probably more important than the uh, complexity that comes with code. Uh, but data can also be the source of simplicity, and that's probably why you're here, because you... Um, you're obviously interested in machine learning, uh, which is not the same, I guess, as saving data to a database for e-commerce purposes. Um, the previous slides were about read and write data. Let's talk about read and train data. So this is the, I guess, first version of the spell corrector of Google. Um, it's 21 line of Python. I think it's possible in some languages to write it shorter, in most languages substantially longer. Uh, but essentially, given enough data, this spell corrector will mostly outperform anything else you can, you can write. Um, at the time it was written, it was written by Peter Novick, who uh, was professor of artificial intelligence at Stanford and the chief scientist of Google. Um, most people did not believe that such a thing would work, uh, that it was possible to write something so simple for something so complicated like correcting the spelling of mostly every language. Um, and so having enough data, and this is what we'll get to, is um, it could be also seen as the greatest simplifying of all. So in machine learning, in the first phase, the one with the clever code usually won. Uh, in the next phase, the one with the most data wins. Uh, and this is, I'll, I'll show you the full slide before, but essentially these are four different algorithms being trained on half a million on this side and then one million data points. And, you know, basically looking at this, you say, well, the guy with the red curve must be the smartest guy because, uh, you know, he's got like close to 85% uh, performance versus 75% for the blue guy. Uh, and there's a difference in complexity. If you actually look at these algorithms, the blue one is so trivial, it's almost difficult to believe. Uh, and the right one is very, very smart. Um, but that's the academic game. So if you're in university, you're going to get extra points for moving from blue to red. Um, if you're in reality, it doesn't matter because the y-axis doesn't matter. The x-axis matters, right? And what happened on the x-axis is you see that as you go to one billion training words, uh, well, well, you can really see that the blue line is catching up, but even if it didn't, even if it didn't, you still have, I can use the mouse, but you can see that it doesn't matter to be the smartest guy at 500,000 versus the dumbest guy at a billion. Right? And I think that this is a, a consistent experience that we've experienced in the last uh, decade, essentially, because this is really, I mean, they wrote this in 2001, um, but the truth is, most people started to realize this starting 2005, 6, 7, 8, etc. 
And for most people, this is still the game that we have to teach people, that having more data and using it correctly with very simple code mostly always wins. Uh, being clever doesn't really uh, help uh, if you artificially reduce yourself to the left side of the axis. Um, so in that sense, data can be a, an immense simplifier. Uh, because you can write stuff using enough data that does a lot more stuff that you would have been able to do before with less data and a lot more code. Uh, there's another wave coming up, it seems, that the one who will win is the one with the largest computer cluster. Uh, this is, uh, you know, basically a typical deep learning kind of uh, um, a slide or, or, or basically basis that you use for that, but to be able to use massive amount of data and massive amounts of computing power to calculate the simplest representation of your data that basically encodes all of your training data with the, you know, the, the sparsest way possible uh, is where it's, uh, what the world is coming to. And in a lot of ways, this is what simplicity is, because it's able to represent all your training data with, or it learns how to represent your training data with the least amount of, well, the, the, the sparsest linear combination of these bases. So learn which bases are able to do this. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, data and um, machine learning are uh, contributing to simplicity because at the end of the day, then the code that you need to run on top of that data becomes relatively simple. Um, <coughs> Coming back to, to the co complexity, people are complex, and when you try and people code and data, it, it usually gets worse. Um, so this is more for your own benefit of running a startup or something. Uh, it's hard to make people simplifier versus complexifier. There's some kind of inbuilt uh, incentive to make things complicated. Uh, not sure where it comes from, but uh, academia is a bit uh, a contributor to that because, as I showed earlier, it's. Um, Complexity wins in, in academia sometimes. Um, and to make people simplify is very unagile, uh, in a sense, because that's where you really need leadership, hard training, constant reviewing, and brutal deadlines and, and brutal goals, right? So you, you cannot be uh, too much in la-la land uh, to do this. Um, and, and rarely do the import airball kind of thing that simplifies um, that make things easy, but obviously make uh, the, the ultimate agility of the company uh, impossible later on. Um, infrastructure is another uh, complexity uh, generator, especially if you're intertwining it with people. Uh, software always has to deploy its own infrastructure. It, it's uh, virtually impossible to create simple systems that do not do that. Uh, refuse reliability because it's way too complex. Right? Simplicity is the source of reliability. Don't try to make a complex system reliable. Uh, it's simply too expensive. Um, processes, which is usually where people go to when they start to get faced with problems of complexity, um, carry enormous risk because they essentially try to do the opposite of what simplicity does, which is people tend to do the process thing, not the right thing. Uh, and if you implement the process and then things change, it's very difficult to change both process and doing the right thing at the same time. Um, it, you can create good processes, so it's not that processes are not good, but then the good processes are the ones that actually um, test for complexity and simplicity. So basically they should com continuously test your ability to change. Uh, most processes are not doing this. They're not testing your ability to change, they're actually testing your ability to do the same thing all the time. Um, communication, uh, another recipe for reducing complexity in most people's mind. Uh, so people do stand-ups, they define protocol and interfaces on how to do this. In fact, you should take a class on distributed compu uh, computing because that's, whether you like it or not, that's usually what people are doing, uh, except they're usually never taken a class on it. Um, and see how a successful communication protocol actually works and try to learn from it. Uh, this is a little bit of a joke, but this is often uh, how communication within companies actually work, right? You have to decide whether you speak TCP or UDP, etc. But often you have to repeat yourself until people get it. Uh, you cannot just say it once and assume that it works. Uh, 
so in summary, again, complexity is whatever prevents you or someone else from doing the right thing now in the future, and simplicity is the opposite. It's whatever helps you do the right thing uh, in the future. Um, we are hiring. We have a little bit of a coding test there. This is a more like a Turing test to see if you can code. Uh, we have many, many different positions in the group from single performer to directors of engineering to whatever you can imagine, data scientists, etc. And I would love to answer some questions if you have some. It can be about anything. So, are there any questions for someone? You can ask about Thanks. anything. Sorry. You can ask about anything, so. Yeah. So, that was very simplified, I guess, yeah? So, everything was clear. So, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in your experience uh, with working with data, working with code, was there any problem which you, which you thought was not breakable into simpler, let's say, problems or simpler way to handle it? Or are there problems right now or machine learning uh, techniques right now which are inherently too complex? No, so I think that, that very often if, if you face, and I'm not talking about building a shop or something like this, right, where, where maybe the, the complexity arises from the number of possible interaction that you have with the consumer. Uh, but let's take a more theoretical problem that you want to create a spell corrector, an entity recognizer, or something that does machine learning-ish thing. Um, most likely you spend 90% of your work, and that's, that's always been the case, in, in preparing your data or, or trying to get the right feature, right? So uh, before deep learning, most people actually spend decades sometimes trying to find a clever way to represent the data. Uh, I think the time spent on actual code in machine learning is usually relatively small and should probably be so. Uh, so I've never, I think that if you, there used to be in the 80s these expert systems, right, where people would essentially code if and then statements forever uh, to try to create a system that would do medical diagnosis or something. But it's obvious that if you have the right data and you've prepared it correctly, uh, you can usually easily beat the performance of this system with, a, you know, 1% of the code. Uh, so I don't think modularization of code, again, in machine learning is, is something that makes a lot of sense, right? You could have a, a 10 million line if-then statement expert system for the 80s. You're not going to make it better by modularizing it. It's not going to happen. Uh, and so usually trying to get the, the data in the right well, the right data and the right size of the data is what you have to shoot for. Yeah, we have a question here. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one, you suggested that more data is always better than a better algorithm, although this is not always true. There is a subset of algorithms for which this has been proven yeah. and a set for which it has not uh, Where do you draw the line in your daily? Uh, job. I mean, sometimes you have to make a call for areas where this is not, you don't know if it's true or not. And then imagine this as a consequence on your bottom line. You want to make well, it, it depends a little bit what you want to reach, right? And I don't know, I mean, there's different ways of interpreting what you said, right? There, there are some. Uh, algorithm cl classes that if you feed them more data and you start to run out of testing data, so you, 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 uh, you, you by the way, uh, you um, overfit completely. Um, but that's not necessarily bad because we're sometimes moving into worlds where the training data is the whole data. Right? Where there's nothing really outside of the data. If you have full view about something, uh, you, you know, we le we're leaving statistics a little bit at the moment, right, where, where sampling is, is the problem. Um, and so in, in general, I guess the only point I wanted to make is that look at both axes, whereas academia tend to focus on that just one axis, saying that there is a data set for every researcher in the world, and that's the thing that's available, and the only thing that you can do is to move along that y-axis of performance. Uh, I think it underestimated that there are some companies that have said, well, 
maybe, but let's see what happens when we push 10 times more data into the thing or, or a million times more data. Uh, and, and usually the return on the, on the x-axis is, is quite dramatic. Uh, one of the best paper on this is, is called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data by Peter Norvik. Um, it's, um, the title is a bit of a joke on, on the uh, paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics, which is this strange phenomenon that, that you can explain the universe by a language that we've basically invented, mathematics, right, or discovered. Uh, and data is a little bit the same way, and it has been underestimated for many years simply because, and it's the same with large clusters of computers, simply because academia never necessarily had access to uh, immense data sets. Um, I think where you draw the line is, <laughs> it depends very much on what exactly you are trying to, to do, right? And what exactly do you define as good enough performance. Uh, because very often you reach very quickly a point where adding more data just doesn't improve your numbers. Uh, it's sometimes surprisingly easy to get to that, to that number. But it's still orders of magnitudes higher than what research typically use. So I would go both axes, right? I have another question. It's more technical, so you have to go into it if you don't. Uh, but so, reducing complexity, uh, you said that the quality that the code should have, and what we wanted to mention, it seems like, like you, uh, yeah, you, you prefer more functional kind of languages, human similarity, <coughs> abstraction, and uh, usability, to get tools in real life, and to show how do you manage communication between different, uh, well, code areas. Well, I think uh, without getting into the you know, not necessarily religious, but, but kind of really cr difficult uh, 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 war between functional and non-functional, etc. Is, is you can write things functionally that are not really um, preparing for change, and you can write things in assembly language that are so well built that you can change it anytime you want. I mean, you, I, I don't think that's the, the right abstraction layer. Um, I think functional languages have a little bit of, a, of an advantage in the sense that they tend to minimize the, um, I have to choose the word carefully, but, but basically because a function tends to behave the same way every time you run it, they, they do minimize this problem that I mentioned with data where you, your code is essentially just having a side effect on the database, right? So, which is, if, if you take a normal framework type code in PHP, Ruby, Python, or whatever that deals with a database backend, you can see the code as just having a side effect on the database. So it's essentially unpredictable what the code will be because it depends what the database is, uh, the state. And that introduces a lot more complexity and I think that people who are you know, we decide to solve this in C or Python or, or, or some kind of other functional, of some functional language. I don't think it's the same layer of discussion. But functional has a bit of an advantage because it's built to us not assume these sorts of things. So, so yes, slight preference. But not necessarily functional language, but funct more functional stuff like MapReduce and stuff like that, probably. Anyone else has a question? Um, okay, so as you said, um, simplicity is very difficult and um, everybody knows that in companies, um, you know, the systems are really uh, complex and not, not clean and all that. And now, um, since you talked about it and since you're aware of it, I would like to know um, what the situation is like at Borda. Do you enforce people to think about it and try to turn it into more well, simpler systems? Well, first of all, at Boda we are a very decentralized organization. So we, um, unlike many big companies, we try to maintain every single unit is really completely an independent unit. So we have no, well, I shouldn't say no, but we have a lot less uh, group-wide uh, things. Like we would say, okay, everyone has to adopt this language, this database, this technique of doing things. So, so we tend to have... Uh, extreme contradictions in the group where, where, where one group is completely not believing in some kind of things and the other one is actually completely believing in it, right? So very, 
so the group is, is very decentralized, and when you decentralize, you don't tell people what to do, because if not, you're not decentralized. That's kind of the decision. So um, wherever you go in the group, you will find extreme different levels of understanding and, and complexity uh, stages. Uh, the, the closer we, you ha are to the founding, the less complexity you usually have. Uh, the closer you are to the teenage years, so 10 to 15 years existence, the more complexity you tend to have and a lot more problems. Um, so maybe, I don't know if I should give you names like this, but you know, I think Zinc, for example, is as past that problem phase and others have not, uh, or are just entering it. Um, if you look at certain businesses we have had for 40 to 50 years, they're, they're remarkably simple. In the sense that I'm sure there was a time in their existence where they were, uh, you know, suffocating under complexity, but, you know, they survive, and so they're not. At the top level, Boda is remarkably simple. And we don't have agile processes or stand up meetings. I think I talk to my boss once every three months, if at all, uh, and everything works perfectly that way. But so I think it's just a question of, of time mostly. Uh, it's hard for me to to find another variables that matters in complexity. Most, mostly is when a company is between 5 and 15 years is when you'll see the most complexity. And, and mostly between, I don't know, 20 and 200 people is where you see the most difficulties with this. And it has to do with the fact that they emerge from 10, 20, 40, you know, and, and are successful, of course, because if not, they don't reach that point. And when you're successful, you have too many features, too many things, too many products, too many people, too many new people versus old people, all kinds of things. So that sounds like an evolutionary process. Uh, Absolutely. Because only the companies which yeah, actually yeah. succeeded will survive, right? And if you, if you survive the initial phase, it means you are successful. So the initial phase is not complex, right? So you, you've been... I've seen startups that are complex at five people, they do not go much further than that, right? But, but those that do, then, then they're not, uh, they, they create complexity and eventually if they survive it, they can become some uh, very long lasting uh, business. I think that's, that's the normal evolution of a company is if you survive that complexity phase. I mean, think a little bit in terms of teenage years, right? If, if you, if you remain a teenager forever, it, it's, uh, it's, it sounds nice, but <laughs> it doesn't make your life easier. Uh, and companies are worse in that way. Okay, sounds like simplicity means scalability as well. Um, you mentioned having a process testing complexity or yeah. simplicity are great. Can you speak a bit more about the tools that you use to, to do this? I don't know if it's a tool, it's that it, there's a natural tendency when complexity arises to create processes to try to reduce it. So, um, so, so typically if you, let's say you have a successful startup and it's run by techies and founders and eventually it becomes totally unmanageable because, I don't know, it's just too crazy, too much complexity, etc., etc. Typically, uh, the board will try to hire some adult supervision of some sort. And the first thing that they will do is to try to find processes, right? And what is a process is, well, think of McDonald's, right? It's like if everyone at McDonald's were doing burgers like they like them, it wouldn't be McDonald's because you would never know what you get. Right? So they do a process and they say, this is the way we do burgers. And in a lot of ways, in companies, that's, that's what management uh, at least tries to do, to, to define processes that, that determines how you do stuff. Uh, the problem with that is that these processes can add to the complexity because they simply determine how you do stuff. But if changes occur, uh, the process can become the problem. Right? So, so the processes are not per se the problem, but, but if changes occur and um, you, know, you, you can't deal with it. So um, maybe an example for management, although it's not directly about process, but it tells you a bit the, the, the thinking. Um, so it's a bit of a story slash joke. Um, there's, a, there's a wicked psychologist, a very nasty psychologist, and he's doing experiments on, on monkeys. And he has four monkeys in the room, one ladder and a banana. And so the first monkey goes up the, the ladder, but the uh, scientist has uh, high cold water and just sprays the monkey and the other monkeys. Second monkey goes up, same spraying method, etc. They stop going up, right? 
Now they switch one monkey, so there's a new guy. Uh, the new guy goes up the ladder, gets prayed, all the other guys gets prayed, etc. You know, after a while, a uh, new monkey comes in, monkey tries to go up the ladder, gets beaten up by the other monkeys. Right? Eventually, all the original monkeys have been replaced. No one has ever get unsprayed. New monkey comes in, tries to go up, gets beaten up. And then they say, what the hell is going on here? He says, well, that's the way we do things around here. <laughs> right? <laughs> but companies are like that, right? I mean, don't underestimate the fact that psychologically, the ability of one person to change 50 people is virtually zero. Right? So if you have a process in place that says, this is the way we do things around here, uh, eventually you're going to get smart guys coming in saying, I think we should do things differently. <laughs> it's not going to work. They're going to get virtually beaten up. And, and so that you have to always see, okay, we get a new process. Tell me how this process will help us change when we need to change. Right? Or tell me how it's going to create the opposite, so how it's going to make it difficult for us to change. Because no matter how complex you're doing stuff, right, if you're able to change it, it's not... Or complicated, like, you know, you could program your whole thing in assembly language and it's horrific and it's difficult and it's non-functional and it's horrifically procedural. It's got even go-to statements called jumps, right? But it doesn't matter. If you can change it, you can. It's not, not a problem. Okay, uh, so let's thank our speaker, Jean-Paul, once more. Thank you.